So my name is Veer. Uh, I am the director of the India office for the University of St. Andrews, and I'm volunteering as a, as a co-chair of the ICT conference this year as well. Um, and I think just for this, this particular session, I am also a student who's been through the student journey of, of applying to various places um, and then studying. I did end up going to St. Andrews as well. So, so I'll bring that into some of the points. Um, but that's my journey, and, and uh, over to you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you, Veer. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ajay Taide. I lead the career counseling and college placement team at Indus. Uh, we started this team in 2012 with our very first uh, graduating batch. And more than 10 uh, classes have graduated uh, with at Indus. I have worked with a few other schools also, including the Dole School, and uh, have had uh, the privilege of working with some of the best minds and learning from the most aspirational students. And I look forward to bringing in my experience uh, of working with the students and the parents and the faculties here in some pointers of our session. So thank you once again for being here. Um, so let me start by just, just talking about how this session came into being. So I travel all over India, parts of the Middle East with a lot of colleagues who, who I traveled with here. Let's, let's have a, I can see Sara and my UK team sitting there behind. And, and we always used to have these conversations as universities about every school is doing a fair today. I'll need a team of maybe 20 people to be cover all, all the different fairs. Then you have agents, other organizations. How can we possibly do it? I speak to counselors and say, we've got, a, we've got a similar problem with agents. We want universities to come together. How can we have this 4,000 universities in the United States alone, I believe. How can we invite everyone to the school and do sessions? Why don't you guys come together? And what I found in talking with various people was that we're talking about businesses, we're talking about schools, we're talking about organizations. We're not talking about the one stakeholder in this conversation that's actually important, which is the student. And so this session actually it came about when talking with different people about these various problems. So just to set the context today, we're not here to, to preach to anyone. This will be very interactive. We want to come up with solutions for, for some of the issues that we might be facing. And also it's not a blame game about the universities are right or the schools are wrong or so and so on and so forth. So everyone in this ecosystem is important. Um, but how can we find the right solutions for everyone? And that's really where this session was was born. So um, with that, I think I'll go through the first, the first bits. And what we're trying to do today is really also talking about the evolving role of university representatives today. Are we just picking up students and placing them in various universities? Or are we, do we actually have an obligation to, to be counselors ourselves? And, and that's one part that we'll cover. We'll also talk about ethics. What is ethics? And ethics is a subjective topic I did philosophy for two years, and that's probably why um, you know, I talk about these things. But what's right for one person isn't right for the other. And so do we need a framework that actually talks about these topics and brings the student journey to the forefront? So these are, th these are aspects that we will cover today as well. And, and when we talk about perspectives, uh, we're going to be covering four major perspectives today. I'll be covering the part about university recruitment, uh, a little bit about the parents, and then uh, I'll hand over to my fellow panelists who'll describe the student journey a little bit um, and what schools feel about the whole process. So with that, let's let's look at why, um, I'll take that mic, I'll, I'll we'll just walk around a little bit. So I'm a, I'm a business and management student, so everything that I've learned is catered towards a particular client, a particular customer, um, and so that's where my knowledge base comes from. And I find myself here in an industry, when we say education, we think about an industry which is ethically correct, which should have models, which should have a student-centric approach. So do, do traditional branding, sales, and marketing concepts actually have a place in this industry, which is meant to be so ethically correct? And so when we have targets, who's got targets here? 500 students. Who's got a manager talking about where the student's coming from, undergraduate, postgraduate? I can see smiles. This is this is a topic I was telling Ajay yesterday that this is a topic we all talk about. We hear whispers about these things, but we don't want to say it aloud. So I'll say it aloud today. But we all have targets. We all need, you know, um, need to work with various people to meet those targets. 
So we find ourselves in, in, an, in an industry which is ethically and morally perceived, yet our outcomes are judged on very traditional models of marketing and sales. And I think that's really where the challenge comes in. So do we need to change this lens? We've got such a, quad, uh, a, a quantitative approach to, to quantifying this, this, these targets of ours. So do we need to change that? And then it comes down to, is there a place for traditional business approaches to what we do? So, and I think there is, and there has to be, because we are in an industry, we do have to meet certain goals and objectives, but can we do it in a manner where we're using these traditional methods, but we're keeping the students at the center of what we do? So let's, let's look back. So I, I look a lot older. It's thanks to some brilliant Sikh genes that I have, and, and I'll, I'll credit them. But when I went to university in 2012, um, there was basically four stakeholders. And, and anyone, this is interactive. So if you feel I've missed out something, feel free to raise your hand or just speak. But there were schools, there were universities, there were counselors, and there were agencies. Am I missing someone? Let's see. OK. Of course, very important. Parents, anyone else? We still didn't say students. Yeah? So um, can we go back to the slide, please? So these were the four major stakeholders that we had. Now look at it today. You've got, you've got ed tech. Every second organization is an ed tech organization. Anyone with a website is calling themselves an ed tech organization as well. But you've got, you've got commission. Who's paying commission to agents? Everyone, right? So we complain about them, yet we're the one funding them. We talk about governmental organizations. We've got online learning coming into play. We've got partnerships across the sector. We've got aggregators. So we just had agents. Now we've got aggregators who actually aggregate all the agents together. And again, who's funding them? And then we complain about agents. So I think. Um, you know, and I'm missing a lot of people, but what I'm trying to, trying to really get across here is that the industry today is no longer just scattered with people in education. It's actually now properly, you can call it education, it's an industry, and there's so many different stakeholders doing so many different things. It's no longer black and white, it's there's a lot of gray area in what we do. And when there's gray area, there's opportunity for any one of us to be unethical. So again, let's let's again little look at the look at the industry today, right? So we're talking about overexposure. So we always talk about countries. You know, we've got Canada, we've got the U.S., we've got the U.K. and Australia. You've got more than 30% of your students coming from China. You look at India being a big market. We've all anyone investing in in-country support. Why are we doing that? Because we see India as a market. We see India as a big market. China's got risks to do. So so you know, the industry is growing. And again, we're looking also at the cost of education that's really going up. So whether it's tuition fee, whether it's accommodation, food, retail, insurances, different medical expenses, they're all going up. Yet we've just recovered from COVID and most people don't have money to spend. And we're seeing numbers go up. From everywhere. You know, and I'm not just saying this from India. I've had the fortune of working around and this is the same story in most Asian countries as well. So let me let me quickly ask a question, and I'll hide this slide. But um, there was a, a, a meeting that happened in London, which was to to put across ethical frameworks for agents. This was people coming together from the UK, from Australia, and other parts of the world. How many of us even know about this framework? Not only do we not know about it, if we don't know about it, my next question is, how are we hiring our agents? How are we hiring? consultants in the business, if we ourselves don't know about this framework which is meant to apply to them. So it's about integrity, it's subjectivity, it's about transparency, confidentiality, and it's again about having that, that professional behavior. So these are the metrics we actually meant to use, whether we deal with consultants, agents, other organizations, and I can, I can say pretty much 100% of this room doesn't use any of these frameworks. So the question is, yep. No, brilliant, and I know Australia does do a, a good job in it. So, so, um, so I hope we can. But for the rest of the world, do we know about these frameworks, and are we applying them in the way that we need to? So that's something that we really want to think about. And and this is this is a document that's there 
available online for free. So I would encourage everyone really to use it. Um, and, and I won't go into all of this, but again, when you talk about the codes and the standards that we're using, very important there that we keep missing out is a student-centered practice. So when we talk about ethics, when we talk about uh, what we want to do with our various stakeholders, can we come up with a framework, not just for our agents, but maybe for ourselves as well? Do we need a framework where we can start thinking, are we doing things in the right manner, in the right ethical manner, in the right moral manner? And I think that's going to be important. And we will have time at the end of the session where let's get together and actually come up with some points and see if we actually need these frameworks, not just for our stakeholders, but for ourselves as well. Yep. Different one. I think that's a very valid point. I think everyone would certainly agree with that. So implementation is key for anything really that we that we want to to have. So um so very quickly let's look at this slide. So this this shows my age, right? So I know what this means. Does every anyone else <laughs> have an issue? Yeah? What does it mean? Who's brave enough to shout it out? Good. So it's fear of missing out. And everything that I've said today all the serious points that I might have made or might not have made, I think you can sum it up there. And why would, does someone get into unethical practices? It is the fear of missing out. And you'll share some experiences, but Thank I, you. I, think, I think it's a good time to, so you just hosted a fair at your school. Yes. I think it's a great example to share and I think that demonstrates this point as well. Thank you. Thank you, Veer, for putting it out so beautifully, the questions that you have portrayed in front of the audience. Like he said, we are not preaching, but we are here to collaborate and create solutions. Collaborate and bring out some innovative ideas which will help us for these good practices. And I'll share the perspective from the counselors from the high school point of view. Uh, we are all abided by the ethics of counseling codes. And we are here to think of the student first, then anything else. Uh, fear of missing out, we, we we opened a Google form, we invited universities. Lot of them, without even thinking, signed up for that form. We had a limited capacity. We had to close that form. And you won't believe, there were many universities who signed up for, for the fair without even thinking about their commitment, without even thinking or planning about their travel, whether they'll be able to make it or not. But think from the high school perspective. Because schools will always have limited capacity. They would be able to host only a particular number of schools, universities at a given time. And naturally, we had to say no to many, many interested universities who were very keen to come on board and interact with the students. So, so are we ethically right in signing up without even thinking about our travel commitment and other factors, or we are we are just afraid, fear of missing out. So that's that's a question I would uh, uh, present to the audience here. That yes, there are various events happening across the country, across the globe, and uh, all universities would like to be a part of it. But somewhere down the line, partnerships will help, collaborations would help. Thankfully, we have growing number of schools uh, having a career counseling office. We have principals, heads, keen and interested in having a dedicated counseling office, giving their students the best opportunity to experience what the world offers. So can we not think of the collaboration in an uh, affirmative manner and commit to such kind of events? Thank you. Yeah, and a, and a quick FOMO story. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest about it. Where's, where's Imperial? There, raise your hand. 
we're great friends. But sometimes you feel, oh, Sarah's doing this. Am I missing out on something? <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, so, but again, coming back to the question, it's okay to have that emotion. I think it's fairly normal. We all, you know, we're in this position, we're competitive. But again, is that impacting the student? Is that being ethically correct in what we're doing? Or there's so many events happening. There's so many organizations, or, you know, having events. We want to be at everything. We want to be in every group. We want to be seen everywhere. It's not because it's going to impact our recruitment. Let's be honest. It's because we know there's a little bit of FOMO happening there as well. So um, let's not allow FOMO to actually come into play when it comes to students uh, because they must continue to be the center of what we do. And we cannot get into a situation where the student is just being told, I've recruited you, now you're going, your journey ends over there. Are we telling them about what the experience is like? Are we telling them about what the application process is like? Are we open to saying you're not a good fit for St. Andrews, don't apply to us? So I think that's incredibly important because not everyone, I think Sir has a question as well. Just making a comment to that. Uh, in fact, personally, I mean, if I, and I'm, I'm talking it from my point of view, uh, the fact that today universities go open schools with schools is also a huge benefit to the student body because they used to apply a, a lot in the dark also. Okay, so, so the big plus is that today students have access, uh, you know, remote access or face-to-face -face access. I also believe that a certain amount of monetization will be important because you've got to also support whatever you're doing and there is nothing unethical about it. Okay, I mean, you know, if, 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 if for example, you have people who are helping you to recruit students and you've got to pay them a certain amount, they're not going to, you're not, you're not going to get volunteers for everything, right? So I don't think, I think what really is concerning is that because of this competitiveness and this huge race that is being built up, is that maybe students are not ending up in the college which would be, which would be the right fit. Right, so there is over outreach, there is an oversell, and you know we we put aside some. T I mean, again, I don't know if that's true, huh? Because that's that's the perception I'm speaking of. Is that sometimes we put aside, we feel that people put aside, you know, everything else. In fact, even student interest, but you know they are interested in getting a student with good, you know, track record, good credentials into their university. Maybe, you know, they're not fit for St. Andrews, all right? But they end up in St. Andrews because they ticked all the, all the boxes and you felt that they would be a great fit, but maybe they would fit better in Bainview River. Sorry, I'm using those examples that you think would be. We're fine. Okay, or the other way around. Okay. But, but no, no just, just so I think if you can introduce yourself as well, I think so it's really I, important. I'm, for I'm the principal at Indus International School here. So I just, I just felt that perspective is, is important uh, as well. So here you've got that. And, and I think very rightly said, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with monetization. You know, we need to be honest. We have agents as well. You know, it's not to say someone's, someone's doing something incorrect. Thank you, sir, for bringing that perspective. That also brings in the high school counselor's perspective as well. Uh, we have huge volumes of classes. Our class sizes are growing. Our council offices remain small. So are we ethically guiding our students is a question. The process at a particular university or a country could be a little shorter than compared to an any other country. So as a counselor, am I really abiding by the codes of ethics? Am I guiding the student ethically right? Or am I just making a hasty job and fine, let me send him to a UK university application process. My job becomes easy. I don't have to write huge letters of recommendation. The student only fills a short application with one personal statement and one uh, referee, one reference letter suffices the admission process. He could be a great fit for any other country, whether it is the US, Canada, Europe, or elsewhere in the world, whether it's in India. Indian universities are also expecting a four-stage uh, application process. So am I, as a counselor, doing my responsibility of ethically guiding the student is a question we all need to ask ourselves today. 
and promise ourselves that what, what are the next steps we are going to do as counselor. Can we seek out for more help? Can we reach out to fellow teachers, uh, heads, principals for more help, more support in terms of guiding our students in the promised manner that we signed up this board for? No, thank I you. Think, thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone wants to share a FOMO story? Doesn't have to be uh, in, in this field, but somewhere, something funny. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll walk over. Okay, go for it, go for it. me think of conversations that I'm having with my colleagues lately because I'm here on a group trip with a few other Canadian institutions and I'm a recruiter from Canada and we're having conversations about um, how Canadian institutions are publicly funded so we're all held to extremely high standards and how we get paid you know we're not based on commission so whether I go to schools and whether I recruit five students or zero students I'm still walking away with the same amount of money and so we try to be extremely transparent with the students that it's the best fit. If you don't want to go to the University of Calgary, that doesn't bother me and that doesn't bother any other Canadian institution to, you know, kind of share the camaraderie and I'll, you know, I'm from U Calgary, but I'm happy to send a student to McGill and I'm happy to send them to U Toronto because we're all excellent institutions and we don't necessarily look at rankings in Canada we're just trying to help the students make the right decisions. And so we've been trying to be really open about that this year. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Absolutely, thank you.
แดงSponsors from our online online. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's do that. Can we see them? But there's one more point over there, and then we can. Mm-hmm. Yes, go for, like go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Time. Like yes, yes, yes. So, please. Um, for those of who uh, you know me from the like you know previous side, like previous life, which was University of Salzburg. There's something which is unethical as per me, and please guide me if I'm wrong here. I have been approached by a few universities and colleges that they want to pay me for sending them the students, and I'm finding. And when I was a university, I never obviously encountered that. And now, you know, we've been like the principal from Indus mentioned that you know agencies are taking money, and they're not obviously they're not volunteers. But I am finding it a little shocking, to be very honest. Have you ever encountered such such a thing? Am I wrong? Unethical? Yes, you agree, right? Yeah. I mean, I love Mula, but not from this way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know Kalyan. Yeah, thanks for echoing my thought. Thank you. <laughs> And I think the others face the same. I can see some hands up. I completely agree um, with what you've just said, um, but I would say as well, I work in a university, and actually I've been approached the other way by school groups who want us to be giving them money for the students and don't understand why, if we pay agents, why we're not paying schools. So I think that does work both ways. But I completely agree with you. There's a there's there's an ethical question there. Touch the nerve this session, no? <laughs> Okay, so I think we've we've gone over a little bit, but I'll I'll just cover this quick slide and then over to you. Sorry, I've eaten into your time, but let's do an exercise today. Once we we get away from the the different sessions, just go onto Google or Instagram or something and just search for anything. IDP, British Council, Saint Andrews, whatever, and see what happens. For the next few days, you'll be flooded with advertising. Consultants, different groups, and you will see things like instant admission, free IELTS waivers, on-the-spot admissions. How many of us have seen that? Yeah, exactly. And so again, let's take this back to the main stakeholder today, and why we're here, and want to be ethically correct as a student. Let's think about for a second what the student goes through in that. So it's not just us; it's not just our stakeholders, but the whole ecosystem today is providing so much information and misinformation to students that, as an ecosystem, it creates a lot of ethical issues for the student. So I will pass it back to you, Ajay, to take you Thank through you. some of the um, counselor perspectives, and please do share some stories as well. Thank you, Veer. Uh, sharing the most common uh, examples: uh, schools having dedicated career counseling offices. students working very closely with them but at times our parents want to have another opinion and that's how they go outside for guidance and uh, they might be going to a consultant to an agent we don't know we at schools don't know and once the admission processes are done we know that the schools work very closely with the child to write effective letters of recommendations prepare correct set of transcripts uh, guide the student very closely to write a very enthusiastic positive personal statements or uh, essays and ensure that all the elements of the applications are well taken care of because we believe that's our prime responsibility but we don't know the parents think of second opinions they go outside a uh, few months later the the agent or the consultant might publish that on their website that this is how or this is where our student from this particular school is visiting so that's an ethical dilemma which i face every year and i would also like you to uh, uh, brainstorm 
whether you have experienced similar situation and what would you feel at this time? Uh, whether it was ethically right for the students to go out for help, uh, whether it was ethically right for the agent, for the consultant to publish that this is an admission achievement at our end. So there are various questions I would like to post to you uh, on this point. There's one more uh, factor which I wanted to cover. Uh, you know, someone talked about the unexplored territories in the responses. We tend to follow the trend. We tend to follow the herd community uh, mindset. You know, there are only two countries where you apply, US, UK, starting, uh, some of them are starting Canada. I mean, are we really, really educating our families about the various avenues and opportunities available across the globe? Or maybe back in India? So we as counselors are also responsible to grow our knowledge and explore the unexplored territories, other countries where the child might be a great fit. We have a family from our school, uh, a, a, a teacher whose child, whose son is going to a university in Singapore on a fully funded program. Okay, had we not explored that option, probably he would have end up ended studying in India, and but it was a dream of that family to send the child abroad for higher education. Today we could achieve that dream only because we tried and we explored territories, we explored universities, and uh, here we have we have a great uh, example today, a successful best fit combination. So that's one of the examples I really wanted to share. From the parents' po uh, point of view, yes. Point number two, for their child to be wanting to be successful in the future career. I, I don't think it's wrong for parents to go outside of for the second opinion. But I would like love to hear from a couple of counselors or uh, school f officials to share their thoughts. If we have the audience available online, maybe you could unmute yourself and share your thoughts. We've been waiting from uh, to hear from you. Or use the chat box as well. We can Thank monitor you. that thing too. Thank you so much. Um, I represent RMIT University, which is in Australia. And the point that you made about um, giving the choices to the students, I you're very correct. US, UK have traditionally been the destinations. And it's very important for them to have um, those opportunities or options available to them. And that's where going out of the traditional counseling becomes important. Uh, counseling is no longer just the school setup. There are influences outside of the school which are equally important parents being one, friends being another. There is a whole uh, platform, uh, social media becomes very important in that. And we cannot neglect that uh, influence that comes from these parties when students are making choices. So I think it's a good idea to give them the choices, but beyond that, which choice is a perfect fit, I think it goes back to parents and counselors. That's my Thank way of you. looking at it. I think I, I take two points from here. Probably we need to start collaboration in terms of bringing in more opportunities for students at various avenues across the globe, one. Second, there's always also one thing that all the universities keeps asking for sessions. Can we have a session with you? Can we visit your school? Can we make a short Zoom call of 20 minutes? Can we meet your students at lunch and things like that? Rather than looking at it from the session point of view, can we not collaborate on the bigger aspect? As a counselor, I would propose, or I have two sets of uh, requests to you. A lot of our students look for research mentorship or teaching assistantships from faculty to write their research papers. Can we not have a framework where we could find talented individuals and connect them to your faculties for a guided research paper program or guided research mentorship program. This will not only look great on the application, but the university will also get to know the potential of the child. The universities would understand whether he or she is a good fit or not. So 
that's my that's my earnest request to university. The second point which I would like to make read here is uh, about The second point which I'm trying to make here is uh, about collaboration. Can schools not collaborate and have students at one venue or one uh, institution so that more universities could address a larger audience in a collaborative manner? You know, the world is more than enough for us. We have enough uh, number of students' applications. We have limited number of seats for universities to fill in. Can we not collaborate on both on the school side and university perspective to bring in opportunities for our students? So that's my second uh, suggestion for all of us here to brainstorm. Thank you. Can I just come in? Is, is the mic working? So I'll just come in and, and say from a university perspective as well, it can become in incredibly challenging actually when you have to go to a particular city two, three times in a month. Why, why can schools not share their agenda? Let's say you're going to Pune or Dehradun or whatever, and you see someone doing a fair on the 1st, someone on the 15th, someone on the 17th. It's a big cost that you as universities have to justify. E. But two, just logistically, it's impossible to do that. You'll have to hire 50 people across the country to be able to meet these requirements. So can't schools come together? and say, I'm hosting a fair on the 15th, why don't you do one on the 16th and 17th? I can see heads nodding, that, that means it'll make everyone's life easier as well. So do we need communication? Do we need to have that conversation with schools? Do we need to empower schools more and students more in that capacity as well? And another point to make is we all target the same schools. And so let's, let me take an example from the regional forums at the ICT. Everyone wanted to go to Bombay. Everyone wanted to come to Delhi. Are we making a mistake by not going out to the tier two and tier, tier three cities more actively where that information is actually probably more required as well? So again, something to think about. But I, I picked up a few points from a session that, can we have the slide up? So, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, please. comes down to a safety net as well. We have a certain number of students coming from the big cities and we feel quite comfortable. I think it, it does come from that place as well. But quickly, let's just, let's just go through that one slide and then you know, we, can, we can have some discussions. But you know, I, I, how many of us have had this conversation where you pick up the phone or you see the number flashing and you know it's a particular parent and you're like, oh God. <laughs> Not again. And you're thinking, I can't ignore it. I have to take it. It's ethically incorrect for me to ignore. And then, but you know where this conversation is going to go. But I just want to point out, and I was actually, you know, my eyes were go to open a little bit in a session that I heard Ganesh do a couple of years back, which was we must also understand the parents' point of view. There's FOMO there. There's what other parents are doing. Oh, you're going to so-and-so and so-and-so. Am I missing out for my child? Yeah. And also just to understand that parents always want the best for their own child. And while they want every child to be unique, they want to follow all the general trends as well because they feel they'll miss out again. 
So again, we come back to that key word. But what we can do as, as universities is, I think, A, let's equip ourselves to be counselors as well. That's one part of it. But two, let's build trust with our parents as well. So the parents are a key component to, to the student journey. And let's go with that understanding that they don't mean any harm. And I think once we do that, we'll also create an environment which is, which is lucrative for everyone. So, so I think I just thought I will end with that. And we just have about 10 minutes left and, and quite a few in the audience today. So I think one, we've... One, one point which I... Go for it. Just like, or maybe summarize the two pointers which I had in my mind. That in terms of partnerships with universities, can we have some more research uh, mentorship program? And can we invite universities not for sessions, but for a skill training, for a lifelong transformational skill driven training program? You know, because today's talent is so innovative and so informed. Before you're coming, they would have done your research about what kind of universities you are, what programs do you offer, how much of cost it may require me to fund my education here. But if you would come for a transformational skill-based training program, you would not only make a child equipped for future, but also future ready in terms of undergraduate education. Many of them are not equipped with the transition or what do we look forward to in a university or work area. So if you could bring in your expertise in terms of training, a skill-driven training program, and not conduct a session on university, but a transformational skill, that would be one of the best uh, uh, training and preparation we could offer our students for the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your question, uh, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Uh, so w I'll explain with examples. I have a student in my grade 12 who's looking for a teaching assistantship under a math professor or a computer science professor. He believes that he has already done his, uh, or he's good at his math HL syllabus that he's studying at school and he's equipped to support a professor at a university. He would be able to design questions for the first year undergraduate program. He would be able to check the ma answer sheets. He would be able to assist the teacher, the faculty at your institute in a much better manner. I have another student who's looking to write a research paper in physics or astrophysics, but he does not have the required resources to know how to write a research paper to know how to, where to publish this paper, or how to collect uh, information, resources for this research. But he really wants to do it. And probably we as a school might have limited resources in terms of that form of guidance. So can some of your professors take up a few students from each school and have them as mentees for research program, uh, guiding them in their research papers? Does that help? Does that give more clarity? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the second point which we made about skill driven training, I mean time management, coding, communication skills, organization skills, leadership, collaboration is one of the biggest uh, missing skills in today's world. Everyone is great uh, working alone, but they don't know how to work in a team. They don't know how to share ideas and work on a project together. You know? So can we have your faculties, you come and train our students on those aspects and help them be future ready. If we can work on these aspects rather than session, I really believe that we could make a great contribution to the future students of the nation. Thank you. So to sum it up, you don't want personal statement workshops, you want leadership workshops. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. So I think what we really wanted to do was, and I know we've taken more time speaking than we should have, but we've got about five minutes. Can we, at let's say every table, come up with six points? Okay, so one is from a school perspective, and you don't have to be from a school to give that perspective. What are two things that you would like to see? Two points from a university perspective, and two points that can build a better ethical framework for ourselves as university re uh, recruitment officers, or whatever it is that we call ourselves. So. Can we do that? 
everyone has papers. So just in your tables, if you wanted to do that for a quick few minutes, and um, let's see what we come up with. There are a lot of universities present here. I just like to get some clarification first. All right. Um, um, so you know, traditionally in India, um, the IB education culminates with what is called the diploma program. All right. Now, I we have great clarity about what happens to a student who does his year 12 through the IB diploma program, even if he does not score a diploma, get a diploma. So there are clear guidelines by AIU. All right. So the Association of Indian Universities has guidelines on what are the requirements for you to get into a college. Now, IB has an alternative program called the IB Careers Program. All right, it's called IBCP. Now, we are amongst the first schools in India to introduce it. So unlike the IB Diploma Program, which is a purely academic program, the IBCP is a mix of both academic and career related. Now, I want to know from universities, what is your take on the IBCP? Are you, are you, yeah, I mean, you, I'm sure that you kind of encountered a lot of students because it's been happening in the rest of the world. In India, there were not many people wanting to take it. So now schools have, like you said, we are amongst the first ones to do it. And I, I can see that there will be a lot more uh, following, a lot more, lot more, lot more schools following suit. So I just want to know, since you've got universities from different parts of the world, as to what your take is on the IBCP scheme. Will you be, con see IB considers it to be an equivalent program to the IB diploma program. Do universities consider this something? I mean, please, if you could just let me know, because I'm worried about it, yeah. Thank you, um, I'm Kira. I work at the University of Bath in England, so I do appreciate it's different in every, every country. I did work in the US in an international school for 10 years and I was um, an IB examiner. So I've worked on both sides of it and I am a huge fan of everything the IB do. Um, we do actually have two of the founders of the IB who are academic researchers at the University of Bath. And I can assure you, Jeff Thompson and Mary Hayden, yep. know it is a competitive university we will accept it um, I would just always encourage you to to get in touch first of all to check because for some particular courses it might not be as accepted but generally speaking you would be able to make it work yeah so we would we would look at it pretty much right now on a case-by-case -case basis it is new for us but any any American universities maybe you want to share share something about the IBCP, about his question, or anyone from Canada? From you? Okay. Thank you. Hey, sir, uh, I think the orientation needs to change. So with New Zealand, there is a body called Universities New Zealand, and we work very engaged with looking at adopting different set of curriculums. So I think it, it would be an opportunity for us to go back and give them a thought around it, and then we can come back to it. As of today, there's no need to change that yet. Universities now, okay, and tell them, because they've given us a list of universities which accepts it, but that list ain't very long, okay? So that's the problem. Now, I've asked a couple of Indian universities and they said, no, we've never even heard of it. So we don't know whether to go ahead with it or not. Anyway, I mean, we've got now the lack of the a first set of, you know, 13, 14 students who've enrolled and I don't want them to be in a situation where everyone says, we don't know who you are. <laughs> you know, that kind of a thing. And, and, and if you look at the program, it is as, as uh, comprehensive and as rigorous as a diploma program. All right. In fact, the DP has three core elements. The CP has four core elements. So it's even 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 wider uh, in terms of its approach. Anyway, thank this you. Is, this is this is going to be next year's session with sir. 
So you Absolutely. can leave the session and we will we will definitely take it up. But what we really wanted to do, I've been told we've got one minute left, but we wanted to actually come up with some solutions. We've run out of time today. But I think hopefully this session, you weren't entering this to get some data and stats. What we really think would be a success for this session is if we can actually go back, think about some of the practices that we implement. And again, just think about putting the student at the center of what we do. I think this, se this session then would be successful. And thankfully, we've had some great interactions. We've had some great uh, points coming from the audience. So, so I think any last thoughts from you? Otherwise, we can close the session then. Thank you. Uh, I want to apologize to our online audience that we were not able to take many comments from them. Plus, but please feel free to write to us on the in the chat box. Please share your uh, thoughts. And we'll compile, we assure you, we'll compile all these comments, thoughts, and uh, exchange uh, the information with the entire community sitting over here and the online audience. That, that's a problem. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for such a contributing audience. Thank you. schools or counselings in school. It's mostly catered or centred towards UK and US, Canada to some extent now, but Australia is always a big miss, even the New Zealand universities. Whereas there are some excellent universities and some excellent programs. So probably schools also need to think about uh, adding up Australia into that. I know because US and uh, UK probably there is strong uh, like historical ties and then all those things which uh, like there's strong government support also but i think australia is also home to some of the world known best institutions so that also needs to be catered because even when i was hearing about here so it's more of like us uk canada <laughs> but yeah new zealand valid. colleagues will agree to that very <laughs> valid point very valid point <laughs> good thank you so thank next you so next much. time next time we'll take that into account but i think we all need to improve but also let's keep in mind we've come a long way from 10 years back as well. Absolutely. So let's continue to develop that and keep the student at the center of what we do. Thank you all. Enjoy your tea, coffee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.